thrilled to have uh, John Barnes and Warren Ellis with us this evening um, to talk to you along with a great panel. Um, Sam Leith will be chairing, a journalist and writer. Um, but I just want to say a few words to start with. This show um, was very subjective in some ways. Um, there, I was very, very keen to make sure that some messages were communicated in a show about comics. And so one of the decisions we made was to make a show about rebellion in comedy. And I think both of these writers were very, very important um, in terms of, of showing that. And, and also, superhero art, I'm, I'm a great fan of superheroes. Many, many different kinds of comics. It's a special place in my heart and love comic readers' hearts. Um, and I think what the British creators have done very, very well was inject a new energy to superhero comics by showing superheroes as anti-heroes, um, right the way from you know, Alan Moore and Grant and Warren, and, and people are still doing that now. So I think that that's a very, very important stream that came from the UK to the US. And it's interesting sometimes talking to people when they ask about the show, and I say that it's focusing on British creators, and they say, oh, but you know, then we won't have any superheroes. And they don't actually understand that some of the most important American creators are actually British. Um, so that's enough for me. Um, enjoy it. Uh, I'm turning over to Sam. Thank you very much, John. That's a very good introduction. Um, well, as, as I said, my name's Sam Neath. I'm a journalist and writer, um, also a massive comic book fan, um, in which is really the capacity I'm here. And today we hope to explore as many of the thousand faces of superheroes as time will permit. Um, so I reckon we'll get up to about 640 or so, um, provided we can move quick. Um, I mean, the sort of questions I think we want to address are, you know, what is a superhero? Is there a particular connection between um, superheroes and the comic medium, and how does that work? Um, and what sort of wash cycle do you need to get blood out of spandex? Um, <laughs> now, in the, the, the panel we've assembled has expertise in all of these matters, and we're going to start um, before we move on to sort of superhero team up of Morrison, Alice, and John Morrison, um, with Dr. Will Brooker and Sarah Zidane. Um, Will is a professor of cultural studies, and he's been formerly known as Dr. Batman. This is not very secret identity. Um, public identity. In public identity as Dr. Batman. Um, as the author of a book called Batman Unmasked, which talks fascinatingly and in a kind of, with real close attention to um, the history of the font of the Earth Terror. Um, and it's one of the few books I've read about Batman, which quotes liberally from Michel de Certeau and Jacques Derrida. So it's a kind of... <laughs> High for me from Fonty Earth. Um, Sarah Zidane is a former pupil, PhD pupil of Will's. She's his co author of um, the My So Called Secret Identity, um, which is a brilliant project um, which is ongoing and which you can immediately log on to Kickstarter to find. Um, and Sarah's going to start tonight by talking a little bit about what to a lot of people is the sort of spandex like elephant in the room, which is a representation of gender in comics because when we think of superheroes, we normally think of a grown man with enormous big bit bits and <laughs> hands like running trousers. Um, and female superheroes are kind of, well, they look to some kind of similar, um, <laughs> at least in the enormous big bit bits department. But their representation is going to discuss, you know, has been problematic, let's say. Um, Sarah has much more complicated and pregnant things to say about it than that. Thank you, Sarah, if you'd like to lead on. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming. As uh, thank you, and thank you for the lovely introduction. And yes, I am going to talk about the representation of gender in superhero comics from the late 1930s, early 1940s to about the present day in 10 minutes. So this is going to be a lightning fast ride through history. And we are going to begin with a selection of characters from the 1940s. And I'm um, going to, the first costume character with powers is probably in American media, and I'm going to be focusing on American media for the majority of this presentation, would be Superman. And rather than have the iconic action comics uh, cover with his first appearance, 
this page in which she says, cites paper waste and hang one on the paper hanger of Berlin, is going to be setting a trend in this presentation of images that may be perhaps a little more obscure or not as widely seen in most of your experience, hopefully. So over here we have Captain America and the very famous image of him punching Hitler on the jaw. And this sort of encapsulates what the 40s was about for superhero comics. It was about World War II and about patriotism and propaganda against anyone who wasn't one of the Allied forces. And it was created by Joe Simon and Jack Kirby, and those are some names that we're going to be hearing throughout the next 10 minutes. In the middle we've got Captain Marvel, and Captain Marvel is notable because his alter ego is a little boy who, by uttering the magic word Shazam, turns into this adult man. To make a quick note regarding Sam's comment about the grown men with underwear and tights, this idea of costuming a superhero in this fashion actually grew out of the popularity of things like serpents and frog men. So that actually was the beginning of that sort of aesthetic. So the thing, 40s, self-sacrificed propaganda. Now, how do the ladies fare in this arena? Well, as you can see, we've got self-sacrificed propaganda and sex appeal. Over here is the Phantom Lady, and she was, although she did not have powers, not unlike Batman's alter ego, Bruce Wayne, she was a socialite in her alter ego and used that persona to suspect that she was the Phantom Lady. Miss Fury in the middle is notable for actually being created and drawn by a woman, Parker Mills, who was one of the only women to be drawing a costume crime-fighting character in this decade. And, of course, the most famous and first super-powered heroine of the genre would be Lillian Moulton Larson's Wonder Woman. And moving on to the 50s, the war is over, the public's interest in superhero comics has waned in favor of things like romance, western horror, and detective stories. There's a Senate hearing crying out that comics are corrupting the youth of America, and Will is going to be speaking more about that, so I'm not going to be mentioning a whole lot about the comics code, except that it led to things happening like Superboy, the middle bear, having a super dog, and these kind of very lighthearted, more comical science fiction type of stories. The Flash, a 1940s character, was rebooted after, actually, Superboy was the first successful post-World War II superhero comic. So, with that in mind, hmm, let's reboot The Flash. He was a Golden Age character as well. And The Fly, over there, is actually created by Archie Comics, which is why I've gotten in here, because most people know of Archie for their teen and romance stories, but they did have a very short-lived, but they did have a superhero character. So, from the 40s kind of cult pinup girls to the blonde teenage goddesses of the 50s, we've got Supergirl, and she was Superman's teenage cousin, and she's a very squeaky clean blonde heroine. A lot of her stories tended to be very romance-centric. In the middle, we've got Saturn Girl from the Legion of Superheroes. She's from the 30th century, but does tend to look like she's just stepped off the set of a 50s sitcom or a teen movie. And on the far side over there, we have that girl, who technically was introduced in the early 60s, but I've got her in there because it's relevant to Will's presentation, as she is the niece of the first Batwoman, and both characters were introduced to the love interest for Batman and Robin, which then Will is going to go into a bit more. Next, 1960s. We've got the number of different things happening. We've got the Vietnam War, the Cuban Missile Crisis, the Women's Liberation Front, the Sexual Revolution, Make Love Not War, the Flower Child ethos, and a slightly larger sense of social awareness than existed in previous decades, which led to things like the introduction of the Falcon, who was featuring in the recent Captain America the Winter Soldier film, updated for the present day, Spider-Man, who was a teenager. And Spider-Man, I know probably everyone's really sick of Spider-Man, but the reason why I have Spider-Man here is because before Spider-Man, most teenage characters in comics were sidekicks, and he headlined his own book. 
and he dealt with things like curfew and girl problems and being bullied at school and all this kind of angst that tapped into a lot of readers' feelings. And um, over there we've got Ben Grimm from the Fantastic Four, also known as The Thing. And he is here because as much as all of these characters are in the tight costumes and heavy muscles, he's representing a not particularly conventionally attractive form of masculinity. And do we see any of this diversity reflected in the ladies in the 60s? <laughs> well, um, I understand that Stan Lee was very happy to include a woman as an equal teammate in the Fantastic Four. Unfortunately, he, her role in the team is that she's a, the leader's fiance. And despite being a grown woman herself, she refers to her as the invisible girl and only achieves woman status after she and Mr. Fantastic marry. Um, you've got Batgirl in the middle who was introduced uh, because the producers of the Batman television show, again, we'll be speaking more about that, uh, wanted to bring in more female viewers. So they introduced this character who um, is meant to be a graduate student and here she's worrying about her run in her tights while fighting the crime. And um, <laughs> finally we have Elastigirl of the Doom Patrol. And uh, the Doom Patrol was interesting because these were all characters who had been um, in some way uh, handicapped or crippled and often felt like misfits or freaks, but then we have Elastic Girl who was a gold medalist turned Hollywood actress and her power is to be able to change size and she's still very conventionally attractive despite what the comic was really supposed to be about. 1970s, the uh, era of black exploitation film. So now we have Luke Cage Hero for Hire. And while we've had the Falcon and Black Panther and other African-American superheroes, Luke Cage was one of the first to have his own title. The other would have been Lobo, but he was a Western, in, in a Western, so he doesn't quite count as a superhero. In the middle, there is the Punisher. And I've got him here not because he was perhaps as iconic of the 70s, but because he was created in the 70s. And um, he became very, very popular in later decades because he was more in line with the kind of um, ultra-violent, ultra hyper-masculine ethos that arose in the late 80s, early 90s. And of course, it would not be complete without another 70s debut, who is Wolverine. And this is his first appearance. So um, there, I read a brilliant quote today from his creator who described his editor coming to him and saying, I want you to create a superhero who's short, Canadian, has a bad temper, and is named the Wolverine. <laughs> that is the result. And as for the ladies, I am going to read the caption here. See Big Barda. See how she exercises. Big Barda is tough. Big Barda is incredibly strong. And um, Big Barda is actually much larger than her husband, Mr. Miracle, and much stronger than him, and very protective of him as well, which was probably the first time you really see this kind of role being flipped in superhero comics. And um, I find interesting is the character is meant to be really strong and muscular. She's still being checked out by the guys over there, but one of them is saying she sure is a lot of girl to watch. <laughs> but, um, so so kind, of, kind of mixed messages there. Uh, also in the 70s was the debut of the first African American, or rather, she's not really American. She is actually Egyptian of Storm. And of the X Men, <coughs> and finally we have Beware the Claws of the Cat. And why I have the cat in there is not a reference to the heroine of my so-called secret identity, but actually because of the character um, having been the, the book was actually written and drawn by women. Um, it was let me see who it was that worked on her. Uh, Marie Severin and Linda Feit were. Um, the creative team behind the cat. And her backstory was um, actually she dropped out of college to marry her um, sweetheart who was a police officer who was really overprotective. Then he died and she didn't know what to do with herself. So she, her um, old, um, some of her old professors contacted her but she was doing these experiments that help unlock all the human potential and she wanted to be a part of that and having all of her potential unlocked made her become this superheroine, the cat. So that's an interesting story there, particularly that it was done by a female creative team. So slightly different things happening, even though it's the, the appearance tends to be very conventional. So in the 1980s, two really big seminal works were published in 86, which would have been 
Alan Moore and Dave Gibbons Watchman, and Frank Miller and Lynn Riley's Dark Knight Returns. And this really changed the face of the medium, uh, the idea that comics have grown up, that superheroes are psychologically damaged, that they, they've got all of this um, baggage that now readers want to see. And the Savage Dragon, on the other hand, came out in 82, so this is what this is before all of that, but I've got him in there because, like the thing, he's got a very unconventional appearance, which is despite the, the gigantic muscles, and he also worked as a police officer looking like that, which I think is actually pretty cool. Um, <laughs> Booster Gold in the middle there is another manifestation of the 80s um, era of being very self-serving and excessive, and he actually entered the superhero um, field as a, as a glory seeker initially. And um, because he hasn't shown up for a while in any of these slides, I've got Superman up there from his cover of Time magazine, which also indicates how superhero comics are very slowly moving into the mainstream of um, not as much as today, but certainly a lot more during the 40s or 50s, or 50s rather. And as for the ladies, we have She-Hulk, who is Bruce Banner's cousin, and she received a blood transfusion from him, which allowed her to turn into a Hulk-like creature, but still retain her personality. Unfortunately, you know, the Hulk is built like a brick, and she, of course, is not. Um, <laughs> The very influential Dark Phoenix saga in the X-Men in which Jean Grey becomes the character of the Phoenix who does have a lot of agency, but she is a villainous character and was killed off as an editorial decision. And over here is Femforce. And while Femforce are very, again, nothing new is happening in terms of their appearances, the thing that is notable about Femforce is that in recent years, there have been an all-female X-Men team happening right now, Wonder Woman led an all-female team, but in the 80s, Femforce was the first all-female superhero team, even if they didn't break any ground in terms of um, less problematic representation of women. <coughs> then the 90s came along, and there was a very definite split in the representation of um, gender in comics. There was the DC Vertigo side of things, which is very well represented in the exhibition and also in Will's presentation. So I've chosen to represent the other side of things, which was the very hypermasculine and um, hypersexualized in general portrayals. But there are some other things happening in this slide beyond the obvious um, gigantic muscles. Um, on one hand, you've got Deadpool up there, who initially started out as a villain, and um, the Milestone is the group of characters um, Blood Syndicate from Milestone Media, which was published by DC, but it was its own company that was created to fill the void of the lack of um, representation of superheroes of color in the 90s. And um, the character Static, for example, who had his own TV show for a while, was also a Milestone character and was eventually got assimilated into the DC universe. And the Authority, which despite appearances, is actually doing some really interesting and different things with the genre that um, it's also on sale outside, so if you want to know what those things are, go, go and see yourself what happens if you haven't read it already. And, and Hellboy, who I, kind of in some ways physically seems to be a bit of a spiritual successor to the thing, but um, and in his backstory, he's actually a demon, but wants to do good and uh, fights evil. And again, the ladies. Um, yeah. But again, there's a couple of other things, a couple of things happening here. Not so much in the case of Glory, but uh, you know, the other two examples. Uh, Gen 13, um, again, dis despite the depiction of, of the female members of the team, the cast was fair, demonstrated a fair amount of ethnic diversity. Um, there's also more ladies than gents on the cover there. Big Hero 6, which is getting the Disney treatment soon. Um, I find it interesting that two of the characters with the most clothing on are actually Honey Lemon and Gogo Tomago, who are both um, the women of the team. And Glory is, is what you tend to think of when you think of women in 90s superhero comics. And she is half Amazon and half demon. And, <laughs> and, 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 and as, a, as a result of this, she has no internal organs. For <laughs> so, um, did things get any better in the 2000s? Well, yes, you've got the Young Avengers, which is a two-time GLAAD Media Award winner. It all for its portrayal of um, the relationship between two of the young men on the team and is also led by a young man of color. Orpheus in the middle there is also um, an African-American young man who wants to become a pro pro professional dancer and was bullied for it. And as he grew up, he actually 
went into professional dancing and um, then began to, through his career, realize that justice was happening and decided to become a superhero. But it's still a different representation of uh, masculinity than has been seen. And, uh, but at the same time, you've also got trends like something called decompressed storytelling, which I like to think of as why spend five pages telling a story if you can squeeze it into 12 issues? And uh, things like having characters come back from the dead and characters that were good or evil, such as the Winter Soldier, who used to be Captain America's sidekick Bucky and is also in the film. And the book is very remarkable. I like to say it's Again, and as well as the ladies, there are some slightly different things happening here. You've got Grace Choi, who is an Asian American woman, except she's huge and she's muscular and she's tattooed and uh, unapologetically bisexual. Cross Gen Media, which was a short lived early 2000s company, had um, a lot of the really typical glory esque female characters, but it also had Meridian, which had um, a, a teenage heroine who was not. And so I had agency and was not over-sexualized, and Trina Robbins and Anne Tumans Go Girl, which for when I was a college student made me realize there are other ways that you can represent women in comics and helped to set me on the path that um, I am on today with my work. And this, so we're getting the question, where are we now? Well, one of the biggest changes to the way that comics are getting out to the audience is the internet. And this led to the creation and um, the, there actually being an audience for works such as Molly Ostertag and Brennan Lee Milligan's strong female protagonist, which just completed a very successful Kickstarter campaign. Um, Alan, Alex Wolfson's the young, the young Protectors, in which the protagonist is a young gay superhero. And there's also a forum for people to complain about things that they do not like in mainstream superhero comics, such as um, Short Cats, DC Comics' Bad at Math, that is complaining about the New 52's um, representation of the female characters, specific, specifically Starfire. And in, in the strip, this, um, the fictional girl Lucy loved the Teen Titans TV show, so when she grew up, she thought she'd read the comic that this beloved character was from, saw how she was portrayed, threw it in the trash, and will never read another superhero comic again. So, um, the, and on the, and, but in mainstream comics, are things getting any better? Um, well, you have Harley Quinn, who appeared in the 90s in a rather modest costume for the genre, reinvented in the DC's New 52, like that. And the less said about that, the better. But on the other hand, you've also got things like the, um, the design of Jamie McKelvey of Captain Marvel, where she's actually dressed in a practical way. Um, Kamala Khan, who is the current Ms. Marvel, and she is a Muslim Pakistani-American teenager. And Kate Kane's Batwoman, who is the first um, lesbian superhero to headline her own book. And there's also Miles Morales, who in another universe is um, Spider-Man. And what's up there kicking the t Nazi tank is the reboot and um, redrawing of Glory, who had no guts. She definitely has guts and very well-developed muscles, and um, it, it's, it's a much very successful, I think, uh, reimagining of a 90s property. And Dr. Faiza Hussein, or Excalibur, who was actually created after consultation with a panel of Muslim women. So another thing is I'd like to share with you is uh, this page of sales figures that was brought to me by Dr. Forrest Kelby of Norwalk Community College. And in the 10 years since 2004 to 2014, Marvel and DC have both seen a drop in their sales, whereas Dark Horse Image and other companies have seen an increase. And this would indicate that people do want to see more diversity in their comics, and they are willing to show that with their money, hopefully. And um, the, am I over time? Wonderful. Then I, then I will conclude here and, and turn it over to um, Dr. Wilson.
and do a similar thing, but possibly even faster, uh, from a slightly different angle, the relationship between superheroes and their, their cultural context. Um, people often talk about, you know, the original Batman, the, the true dark, gritty Batman, it actually only lasted one year between 1939 and 1940, but it was a very interesting and rich year. This year when Batman was perfectly prepared to kill people, um, rides his bat plane out of the sky, spitting death. Much so I hate to take human life. Much so I hate to take human life. <laughs> this time, necessary. This was in the first episode, I think, falling right into the acid tank. The modern Batman, of course, would throw down a battery on the rope. Not this one, a fitting ending. A fitting ending for his kind. So this was the Batman for one year before the introduction of Robin, basically, in 1940, when things start to get clean up. Uh, no guns and no police. At the same time, Superman had an interesting first year, the first couple of years between uh, 1938 and 1940. As it says here, champion of the oppressed, the physical marvel who had sworn to devote his existence to helping those in need. I've actually got a PhD student um, writing his PhD called The United States of Superman. He's far more expert than me. But um, he's currently studying this period, amongst other periods, when Superman was something of a social reformer. We see him here. Um, destroying cheap rental apartments the government has built. He, he, he tackled slum landlords and so on, abusive, abusive spouses. So the government rebuilds destroyed areas with modern cheap rental apartments, eh? Not bad. <laughs> Governments have been fine work out in a long time. One fire trap less. So Superman there has something of a social conscience which was uh, revived again for a brief period by Grant Morrison in the new 52 recently, where he wore Superman t shirt and jeans. Moving on to the 1940s then, as we know, war was declared. Uh, and um, many of the superheroes of the period were enlisted into a kind of metaphorical or symbolic visual battle against, well, there's, Cap there's an iconic moment of Captain America actually uh, hitting Hitler on the chin, the submariner and more overturning a, a boat full of Japanese. There were many, many literal images like this of superheroes tackling America's military foes. Superman, Batman and Robin were also involved, or at least, or, or so it seems. Um, in fact, Superman, Batman in particular, was not ever really depicted taking part in the war effort. There were many covers which showed him <coughs> exhorting readers to buy war bonds and stamps, that it says on these ones. Uh, but in the stories themselves, Batman's adventures, as I found when I looked more closely at them, and mostly continue with him um, thwarting jewel thefts from the Penguin in Gotham City. So they remain pretty much as they were before the war. Uh, one image of Batman, <laughs> yeah, an image of Batman keeping those bullets flying. But you see, he's not really, this was just a cover, you see. Uh, inside the comic, business continues as usual. And you see from the cover, it says, keep, keep those bullets fly, flying, keep on buying war bonds and stamps. So it's really about the war effort at home. And here, two more covers again. Even though they're in the G, you can so on. You can see it's metaphorical, really. It's not really writing in either. Inside the comic, they were doing the same kind of thing with the Joker and the Penguin and the Cat. And then it was just the cover which was taking part in the war effort. But again, it was encouraging civilians to support the troops. I told you we're going fast. 1950s, Hugh App investigates the Red, red Clown. Sounds like Joker or something, doesn't it? But it's not. Um, well, the, the whole gay readings of Batman thing is, 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 is familiar. <laughs> It's almost over familiar, so I don't, I don't want to exhaust it here because it's almost too well known, too easy to get laughs out of the gay Batman. I like this gay Batman very much, actually. I think it's something to celebrate and embrace. Uh, the rainbow Batman wearing his... It, Rob, I like the way Robin says it's a red costume, it's a pink costume. <laughs> Isn't it good of me? He's wearing the pink costume. He must, he must wear a different colour Batman costume every night. So for a while, there were these, you know, flamboyantly and fabulous... They can very easily be read as, as gay homoerotic stories. Um, there's a lot of websites which are, which make, you might say, cheap jokes out of um, panels with <laughs> panels with innuendo. This is a much more no, this is this is a much more innocent one than, than some some I could have found. If you look online, at least you find like Batman's greatest bonus and so on. Not the, the Joker's greatest bonus. Anyway, they have a bonus. Um, so here's one where you know um, jokes can be made about meanings of the word gay in the 1950s. And, and the present day. So there's a lot of fun to be had um, for finding innuendo in Batman comics of the 1950s. At the time, though, it was not considered to be fun. 
and these were um, censored. Well, first of all, we're going to go uh, first by Dr. Frederick Burton in the Senate Subcommittee Trials of 1954. Often less celebrated or um, foregrounded is the fact that Burton also criticised Wonder Woman for lesbian sadistic overtones, but think why. <laughs> And also um, Superman for uh, for Nazis, but he, he, in a way I like I like and respect Burton. In, in some ways, he was misguided. He um, he felt that Superman must represent Nazi ideology just because of the similarity between Superman and Ubermensch. And also notoriously, he felt that the Blue Beetle was a Kafkaesque story. He was thinking about you know the guy who turns into a Gregor or whatever turns into a beetle. Beetle is just a slang term for cop in the 1950s. So in some ways, Burton was very much. The board. However, Frederick Burton's campaign, which led to those subcommittee hearings, had a significant effect. One of the most notable was the introduction of Batgirl and Batwoman, as Sarah noted, as kind of double dates for the um, dynamic duo. So, you know, there's all this flirting going on, but it seems to me that we can still very easily weave queer meanings into the comics of uh, post-1954, even though you've got this ostensible straight couples. They're still hanging out, it's still very much in these frames even, it's about the, um, the same sex couples and the, the, the real, there's a real queerness about them and their double lives. Not to mention the fact that the couples are always very troubled, you see. Batman, look at him staring out at us in dismay. <laughs> I've always managed to escape death traps, all kinds of danger, how do I get out of this? It's not like, it's not like a romance topic, comic which ends happily with the formation of the heterosexual couples. Or Sexuality is treated as a, a trap and a danger which they have to resist. So there's still a lot of opportunity, even in these stories, to read games. <laughs> 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 now, we'll see what became of Robin. <laughs> he dies. Robin dies at dawn. This was a uh, fantasy adventure which was uh, fascinatingly revived by Grant Morrison in the recent um, Batman of 2006 onwards. A, halluc a scientific hallucination, a drug-induced hallucination. But in this comic as well, uh, Robin amusingly fights a, a, a big pink alien and he says, come on big boy, I'm ready for you. I haven't shown this. <laughs> 1960s, I'm sure we're all familiar with the um, campy TV show. The, the gay readings, it seems interesting to me, can never be repressed for very long, if at all. In fact, they always come back. This was the comic book that um, producer William Dozier, supposedly according to anecdote, picked up for a flight from something like New York to LA, picked it up and saw, you know, this could be pop art, we could make something out of this, comics could be pop art, and this supposedly was the, the comic which inspired him in its, its color scheme and its simple, simple graphics, which inspired the Batman TV show, with of course Adam West and Burt Ward. DC Comics then, there's an interesting kind of relationship, a dynamic of borrowing and borrowing back. DC Comics, I discovered in my research um, that Batman was actually going to fold. Batman was actually not doing very well financially during this period, and its, its success was revived by the television show, even though that television show is much derided by some fans as being you know, aberrant and not pure, dark, gritty Batman. DC Comics then realized they wanted a big thing with the TV show and did these go-go checks. Definitely coming, the brand new look go-go checks. Don't hesitate, choose the mags with the go-go checks. And DC Comics, in fact, started to exaggerate the garish colour, simplify the artwork, and increase the number of kind of big power wham. And again, Grant has go-go checks on the on an animal man. Remember, go-go checks on an animal man, which I think was set in the 1960s. So the go-go period was an interesting. Didn't last long. 1970s. To simplify, it was the period of um, social realism, social social comment, and social criticism. Perhaps best epitomised in the Green Lantern, Green Arrow relationship. Uh, Green Arrow is a kind of radical liberal, and Green Lantern stood for the establishment. And there were some great storylines by Denny O'Neill and Neil Adams where they drove across the country um, encountering America's social problems and debating them. In this one we see Speedy, Green Arrow's sidekick, is the junkie. DC had had some integrated problems there. There's a great one, I don't think I've included it here, I haven't, where um, an African-American comes up to Green Lantern and says, you know, you've done a lot for the blue skins and the yellow skins, but you can do for the black skins. Says, you know, that's what's going on. Um, one of Denny O'Neill's greatest iconic moments. Here's one, a typical scene where they're arguing about, you know, 
bosses and power and corruption and authority. A uh, great period for that man as well, the um, hairy chested um, playboy. The, the, uh, the world traveling hairy chested playboy, when that man doesn't take off his mask, he takes off his shirt to fight Ra's al Ghul in the desert. The introduction of Ra's al Ghul again by Danny O'Neill in uh, I think 1969, 1970. So a new period for Batman as well. Grittier, more street level, more basic. And it was supposed to white escape being out of the 1980s. Reagan himself appeared in Frank Miller's Dark Knight Returns, where he was a hero or a villain. Open to debate uh, whether Frank Miller's a hero or a villain. Again, open to debate, really. <laughs> <laughs> um, a lovely set of four panels where we have a transition between the American flag and Superman's chest emblem. Superman is essentially a kind of um, a tool of the Reaganite government in this story, and in this scene is being asked or told to track down and tame. Arkham Asylum, a serious house on serious earth. It's a quote from Philip Larkin, but it seems to me to sum up an awful lot about the late 1980s, if that man stands out, mentioned. It's, uh, you know, it's very, it's, it, everything took itself very seriously, didn't it? These were art books, they were um, glossy, uh, differences in production enabled this kind of hardcover graphic novel. And this was Christ, good artwork by Dave McKean, very, very complex collage, and also more complex literary storytelling. At the same time, though, we had this from Grant Morrison, 2000 AD, these arrogant, superficial, pop hero zeniths. So there always seems to be different sides of things going on. There's gravity and levity at the same time. I think it's hard for us to simplify what was going on in any particular decade to any one poem. 1990s, I don't know if you remember uh, Carter USM, the love album, but maybe not. Some of you may not remember. Uh, Doom Patrol. A lovely long running comic by uh, Richard Case, Grant Morris, and others in the Vertigo line, the Vertigo imprint. I think it was edited by Karen Berger, also included um, Sandman, Shade, and Hellblazer, a kind of more indie alternative and actually more queer imprint from the early 1990s. So there's Cliff and Crazy Jane standing in the rain in a typical scene from Doom Patrol, which often would quote Morrissey lyrics in town. <laughs> Morpheus, you know, it was a period when you had people doing a lot of, doing a lot of that. <laughs> <laughs> As indicated as well, Shade the Changing Man by uh, Peter Milligan and uh, Apollo and uh, Pennington, I think. So it was a time of emo comes through emo. This kind of very pretty emo boy is being used as a pseudonym stereotype. But at the same time, we had this kind of character, John Constantine and Jesse Custer, Jesse Fisher, and Hellblazer, uh, Garth Ennis, uh, Steve Dillon, I think Will Simpson on the, on the left. Again, they look kind of similar if you put them side by side, this kind of anti-hero, grizzled, stubble, bit of a bastard. <laughs> the Authority by Warren Ellis. We're here to hit you. A great panel of uh, Elijah Snow booting Dracula in what he euphemistically describes as the lap. Getting, uh, kicking his groin out of his, his body. And Transmetropolitan and uh, the Invisibles, also the main characters, look quite similar when you place them side by side. Two thousands, then briefly. Well, what have we got? Grant Morrison's All Star Superman is, on the face of it, seems idealistic, simple, but in a good way, very kind of noble, very pure. This is a genuinely good character, a simple, good character, um, who saves the young woman from suicide in a comic, and that comic has actually wonderfully saved young people from committing suicide. But at the same time, we seem to have something very simple and pure there, but that story is also about multiple versions of Superman, and that is what I would say typifies the 1990s, uh, sorry, the, the 2000s, if I had to put a name to it, prismatic, um, multiples, various versions, variants of things. Grant Morrison's um, Batman, even in this one, Time of the Batman. We have Bruce Wayne, Dick Grayson, and Damian Wayne as Batman. In Grant's uh, Batman Incorporated, we have various Batman all around the world. So it seems to me a certain a strand, a significant trend in the last decade, is different versions of the same thing, exploring what these icons mean, Superman and Batman and other characters, by looking at different versions of them, whether through time or through space. As David 
Barry said, where are we now? Well, you also said hero support. Where are we now? Well, you know, we're the support apps here, but it, um, I want to commandeer this uh, moment to tell you that we launched our Kickstarter last night for our own comic, Our Closely Secret Identity. Lovely painting there by Faye Dawes, uh, Dawson, who writes for us for the um, 2000 Reading Magazine, a friend of Pat Mills. My so-called secret identity launched last night. If you look at Kickstarter, if you look at my Twitter, you'll see I'm talking more about it. I'm not going to uh, overstay my welcome by talking about it here, but I just wanted to be a bit cheeky and leave you with a slide <laughs> and positive comment about my own project. Obviously, I'll be very grateful if you look at that. Thanks very much for your time. why I find it quite hard to to do a lot in the new DC because it's like a new thing starting up. What attracted me to DC in the first place was the, the 70 year history and the idea that these characters were represented in different ways through different decades. So for instance, my version of Batman tried to accommodate all of those versions. You know, the idea that for me when Batman was 19, it was 1939. When Batman was 24, it was 1956. When Batman was 25, it was 1971, and so on. So I kind of, that's what made made it special for me, what makes them interesting. is not the, the idea that these characters could be real or are believable, but that they actually exist as, as <coughs> weird, repeated beings that can be played with. You know, the history and the, the endlessness of them is what excites me about and the variations in the characters mm. excite me. Yeah, I mean, it, it was, yeah, Ted is way academic about it. Oh, let's go for it. It's way academic. Ted is way academic. It's comedic, though, Alton. Actually, it's, it's, it's stock characters Ooh. and situations. <laughs> wow, that'd get me. Red book last year. Well, it's out now, isn't oh. it? Oh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, right now. You see, what you've bought into is the fact that we're just going to go on like this for hours and hours. <laughs> <laughs> in here with us yeah. as we go through our three comedy voice theatre. <laughs> <laughs> you know, allowed right out to talk shit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's been about 15 bloody years since the last time you let us do it. Yeah. Um, it's, it's stock characters and situations that you improvise around. Um, but the important thing is uh, the, 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 the characters and situations are allowed to reflect contemporary concerns. That's that's the thing. Um, these, and the fact that they, they also they still can. Yes. And the way that Sherlock Holmes still can, right. and King Arthur still can. <coughs> something about these characters that continually stick. Mm. We can continually use them for that. Yeah, I mean, um, people something. want to call them st stereotypes, they are about archetypes, so they can apply in some way. Um, to any given contemporary moment. So do you kind of need that cultural sort of purchase mm -hmm. on them to make up for, in some cases, I mean, one of the things I think coming in from the outside, you might say that as a writer, you're supposed to keep 
trying to create tension and risk, and it's difficult to work in a situation where nobody except for Uncle Ben um, ever dies for good. And right, that but that's not done. necessarily what the readership of these works is turning up for. Um, the, the, the tensions and, and conflicts um, that normally make a bit of drama go actually work quite differently in superhero comics. Um, the, the tensions and risks are almost secondary <coughs> to actually seeing the character go through the paces and see what we understand the tenets of those principal characters are being applied to real situations. People actually just show up um, to see if those characters are introduced into a situation of novelty. Where the tension and the jeopardy is applied to someone else, uh, superhero comics, uh, at least in part, uh, became risky fiction. Um, we're not in fear for the central character, the protagonist. Uh, we're in fear for the people mm -hmm. the protagonist bump up against. And also, I think the, the reputation is, is quite important here. And in the sense that, yes, for a certain X number of <coughs> years or even centuries, we as writers have been told that those things are important. If, for instance, you were living in Australia 50,000 years ago, you'd be part of a continuity of generations who go into a cave and retain <coughs> in as exact detail as you possibly can the story the previous generations have been telling since people were telling stories. And I think superhero comics are much more like those paintings that are regenerated every generation. We're seeing it again now. DC are doing the Doomsday, the death of Superman yet again. They're doing the origin of Batman yet again. They're doing the Crisis on Infinite Earth yet again. And all that's happened has been repainted for another generation by another generation. I mean, These stories are not like the ones we write as, say, novelists or short story writers or as, as screenwriters. These are, these are repeated cyclical things that are retold again and again. So it's very much something that Sarah was talking about. In this long history, as she was able to say, here's the men changing the characters, and here's the, here's the girls, <coughs> they still look like that. Mm. Um, is there a sort of, I mean, you guys are both on the writing side of things, um, is there ever sort of inescapable potential that female super characters almost always from ancient introductions seem to have to be drawn that way, but that actually what they're doing in the story might be at odds with that? Um, I think in terms of the visual depiction, I, I think we were talking about this a fairly early on when I came out of Texas, and the fact that a lot of comics have this tradition <laughs> of being um, young men trapped indoors <laughs> <laughs> uh, who realise they're getting paid to draw boobs. So, um, that's, 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 that's part of it. Especially after the 1990s and 50s. That's the kind of time that on? I'm getting the thumbs up from over there. It just sounds like we're in a cave out here. Excellent. Um, so that, especially when you started to get people like um, Rob Liefeld and that, that era of the, the young 20-somethings, the, I believe the, the phrase, the inmates were running the asylum was bandied about a lot in regard to that period of... of uh, that also era. applies to 40s comics to some extent mm -hmm. uh, because comics production in the 40s were by the boys who didn't go to war. Yes. Well, I mean, teenagers or 4F. Mm, 4F, yeah. Um, Still printed as 4F, yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, I, I got that not only did you have that sort of hyper sexualized, hyper masculine thing going on coming from these writers and artists who are 4F or too young to go to war, uh, but they were trying to fight the war on their terms on paper. Mm -hmm. it, it's quite charged with that, a lot of that stuff. So these are, they're also their idealized figures. So I mean, they have to. The, the masculine figures are as outrageous generally as the, the, the female figures. And even with that, I mean, I, when, when I thought about this thing, I look back, the first female superhero is my uncle, who's actually, who's a, a middle-aged woman who dresses in long johns and puts a pan on her head and fights crime in her local ghetto, her, her New York tenement. And so there was something there, I think. I mean, it's the one defense you'll give of Rob Liefeld, but yeah. Robbie drew women, women with no internal organs who <laughs> defied any law of physics. 
the men were so massively muscled as to be almost paralysed. They were so big he could turn his face into camera on profile and his chest. Yeah. Pretty yeah. tense on. <laughs> <laughs> they were absolutely solid. You could eat your tea off this <laughs> These were serious. So, I mean, uh, the, the, the exaggerations existed across the board, I think. And although, yeah, I mean, there's, there's always, uh, I think it's important to look at representation, but even through the years, there have been a lot of different versions of how to look at female characters as well, like as male characters. I'm, 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 I'm trying to remember the name during your presentation. I'm thinking about Fletcher Hank. Yeah. I think that was the name. Stardust Star. Stardust Star, who also did a female character called, I want to say, Phantoma. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yes. Mm-hmm. She's a rather grim, muscular jungle woman, yeah. mm-hmm. as I recall. But it was quite peculiar that it was almost a, a mask like face. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah. And there definitely are exceptions. Yeah. 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 And also, you have to know, like Warren said, a lot of these have been drawn by young men. Who were sitting indoors drawing comic guys? They just loved to draw big, sexy girls and big, sexy men. And that's what they did. The figures are painted, but the nude figures basically took a real good look at them. They just the nude studies, so they're actually drawn by just kids one handed all of them. (laughs) 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 And that's why they look that way. Westman is also sort of about that, isn't it? Yes, it's all about that. I mean, it's like I grew up with someone who drew these things. Honestly, that's what I was bored for. I used to hide them under the carpet so my mum and sister wouldn't find them, but of course they were digging them out and reading them every night. <laughs> <laughs> but that's what they were doing, just yeah. cloistered boys drawing sexy girls and sexy guys. <laughs> so we're done. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions? <laughs> so I feel so, there's seems to be a thing which I just want to kind of open as definitely kind of scale in superheroes because there seems to be kind of almost two extremes that there's a sort of daredevil Batman sort of character who's essentially fighting on the streets and punching mm-hmm. villains mm-hmm. in the door and the, the kind of at the other end of it you know these sort of fantastic four type things or you know you've done with mm-hmm. Superman where you have to take them into alternate dimensions mm-hmm. and every week instead of saving mm-hmm. you know somebody from being beaten up mm-hmm. um, they're saving the universe from being split into I would say, I always thought that was two ends of the same thing because, I mean, you'd be able to correct me, but particularly in contemporary <coughs> Batman stories, there is always that one panel where it's a wide view of the city and Batman is mm. just a tiny figure overlooking it. Uh, and that scale used to different effect. It's just, don't think it's just me and there's all this down there. Um, which to me ties very much into Fantastic Four. It was just four people versus mm. some entire big folk or um, <coughs> the scale is important big folk superhero story, especially when it's written very well. Uh, so it, it has to have those se- that sense of near beat to Cosmos. Otherwise, it, it's not a superhero comic anymore, I think. That's a good point. I mean, what would you, how would you then sort of define a superhero if that's what? Um, well, I don't know. Would you? I would start with the idea that the superhero. Is, is a leap, a search for, or a step towards trying to find new myths for the contemporary era, uh, which means they have to be you know, larger, louder, and flashier than they were. Um, even the Norse and Greek myths can seem quite self contained and parochial and almost like chamber theatre uh, compared to the myths we create now for cinema. Because um, that means there's a kind of inflationary economy. That and the fact we perceive of the world is bigger. Um, there was a time where in our heads the world was wherever we lived, wherever we could walk to, and, and the rest of the map was dark. Uh, we do get the full feeling now that we live in a very big world and in all the detail we learn about the world that we live in is much more. Uh, and so our myths have to reflect that. Uh, they have to be on that cosmic scale, at the very least, global scale. Or if they are ground level, it's a big city that's too big to get your arms around and you are just one small speck on the corner of a building overlooking it. I think scale is an important part of of that form of fiction. Why I think we're coming just slowly through the middle, 
it's, it's why I think that the, the more cosmic, high-level superhero stories are actually much <laughs> more realistic than Batman. Batman just couldn't happen. You know, Christopher Nolan gets kind of near it where Batman's almost crippled in the last one, but he can still fight with super wrestling pain. You know, he's, he's still capable of that. But the real truth is that Batman would work for a week and his knees would be fucked and he'd be painted <laughs> and he'd be taking too much gas. It would all just be a mess instantly. It can't happen. But so for me, yeah, maybe somebody could suddenly arrive from another planet that just happens to absorb sunlight. So I can't, believe, I can't believe that those, those things are more believable for me. But also within our heads, I think that the, the, the battles that we fight out in our heads daily are cosmic battles, you know, the existential fears that we deal with constantly, you know, the, the thoughts that we all go through, love, death, guilt, loss, your mum's died, your dad's died. These are possibly the things we're best at talking about because they, they translate them directly into symbols and that's why I love them. And it's the realistic stuff to me is ridiculous. I mean, I feel literal. There can't be a realistic superhero like that guy, Phoenix Jones, and what, you know, like, it's bullshit, but there can be metaphorical superheroes and symbolic superheroes, because in our own lives, we're all fighting cosmic forces, and we'll all fight the ultimate enemy one day in our head, you know, so I think they work best on that level, and, and I think that's where the scale is important, because the scale of our own tiny experience is epic and universal. Yeah, I really like what Warren's saying about the um, the fact that even with, with Batman, you've got someone with a certain power level, but he's still on a certain scale compared to the city and the Fantastic Four, hopefully small compared to the cosmos. But an interesting thing about Batman and other characters like Daredevil is sometimes they're pitted against much bigger scales. I mean, in Grant's JLA, one of the most interesting things is where Batman mixes with these metahuman characters. Mm. He's mixing with the fastest man alive, Amazon, a Kryptonian, the man's most powerful <coughs> weapon in the universe, and he actually, in the first storyline, he, he beats him through his, uh, his cunning. He, he's the one who realizes the white Martians are Martians and are uh, bonded with the fire. The whole thing about the way Batman can work with subterfuge is because he understands the Earth's final and all of their weaknesses, and if he wants, he can, you know, disrupt Green Lantern's thinking and totally yeah. disable his ring. Also, in Frank Miller's um, Daredevil, he says, um, I can't remember exactly which one it is, but he comes up at one point against Iron Man and Captain Avenger and rescue, uh, Captain America and rescue Avengers. I, I like the way you have this kind of power levels, you know, people are totally outclassed, and sometimes they can really step up. You've got these characters who are much more obviously accessible as new comic characters to us because they're basically human. And I find it quite aspirational and inspirational, the way those people can walk among basically demigods. <coughs> well, the, the Batman style, I mean, in Grant's JLA, the Batman thing seems so different to me. Um, Batman is based on the role of the trickster. Mm. The trickster god is always the least physically powerful mm. in any pantheon. He appears, he appears, he appears in. Um, but they always have the edge. The, the, the daredevil thing, yeah, that, that was always a bit odd. <laughs> um, just throwing up another team which exists in that universe, but you've got these incredible powerful characters who can juggle planets and, mm. and the characters who can lift up a shot. Right. And no pants, man. <laughs> <laughs> Not coming to a cinema near you. <laughs> but it's a charming oddity, I think. You, you've got these various degrees of strength mm. between people who can fight galactic. Well, again, when you see them purely as just metaphors and it's music, mm -hmm. it just means, oh, the smallest part of me can somehow find a moment where it stands yeah, up. Yeah, it, it, it's that the, masking. The human part of me can be the thing that saves the day today. Well, you've got Batman oh. shooting Dark Side. Yeah, of course, you know. Yeah. It has to be. Exactly, he's facing off against the gods using a gun for once and going back Because in your head, that's what it feels like to go up against mm -hmm. depression mm -hmm. and or grief mm -hmm. and or... And with some of these characters, it is the masking effect. So I know characters like Spider-Man or Daredevil who have something you can relate to that is very human. They are you in that story when they're plugged uh, into a very esoteric setting. I don't know, Spider-Man fights his family in the moon or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, it's, that, it's that masking effect that allows you to... If you if, that, if you allow that character to represent you, then they just move to another character. And that's why I love the, the Jim Starlin Cosmo comics in the 70s. <laughs> and Starlin would just do direct confrontations with, you know, here comes a representation of your self doubt. Mm. And then Captain Marvel would kick the fuck out of him. And by the end of it, ah, self doubt, fuck you! <laughs> Firing yeah. into the depressive Adam <laughs> Warlock thing. That, 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 it was Starman again, it was Adam Warlock. Uh, it did the same thing. Here, here, now you get to fight death, you get to fight uh, 
uh, the, the embodiment of suicide and that happened. <laughs> but afterwards, it always be Adam Warlock in his hand saying, I've won, but it's driven me completely mad. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and until by the end of it, he was just this shambling wreck who welcomed death. <laughs> <laughs> Do they have to be wish fulfillment, or do they work best when they're wish fulfillment? Because there's this whole sort of thing that, you know, we, we talked last week about how superheroes in the sort of, you know, 80s, 90s, suddenly it was all, all dark, they're all damaged. Um, is there a sort of limit to how far you can go down that road? I, 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 I think um, if you replace wish fulfillment with, with a word like processing, because it, something slightly larger, because it, it can be um, experience and okay. But as Grant said, it can also be uh, a masking effect that allows you to deal with depression or allows you to deal with pressure going in your life emotional as well as uh, physically and psychiatric. Um, it, it, it's this kind of fiction uh, enables a kind of processing uh, of feelings and travel uh, above and beyond that sort of simple wishful feeling. or whether it's really grounded, if it's honest and it's genuine and talking about feelings or processing mm -hmm. that the writer or the artist has gone through and it can be punitive to people who maybe stumbled down that path, mm -hmm. you know, it can be, it could be a dystopian story or a utopian story, but there's a lot of it's just telling the truth to some people and it's both. And it's why the best ones tell the tale more time. Is it more, I mean, is there something more satisfying about working on your own characters? As opposed to, I mean, you know, your own character, you created for, I mean, I've, well, I mean, you spoke very quickly to you on stage, and I see the thing of the big <coughs> superhero franchise is a kind of corporate owned mythology. Yes. Do, um, I don't think shortly after that, I saw you signed up for another uh, run of the Avengers. Um, <laughs> <laughs> do you, but do you, you coin superheroes? <laughs> <do you? laughs> <laughs> yes. But coins have <laughs> They do. Are the, are the corporate mythologies limiting? Or, I mean, I've, maybe you've got a slightly different take on this. Um, there, there are inherent limits to the material. Um, and, you know, going in, there are limits to how you present them. Uh, beyond that, I mean, not a whole hell of a lot, to be honest. I mean, if you're moon Knight, I do just came out. Um, there, there's mostly a, a mushroom-derived hallucination uh, happening inside the brain of a caveman with fungus growing on his bone matter. Um, so they that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we've all been there, haven't we? <laughs> <laughs> you, see, you see, I'm writing about the brain's worst grandest thing, so we have to process it. <laughs> um, that, that, that there aren't really limits in, in those terms. What about Apollo um, and the Big Mighty Bow? You couldn't do that with Batman and Superman? I don't know. Um, I there may have been a space where you could, to be honest. Really? Maybe. <laughs> there might have been a space. Yeah, and there's still an Elseworlds, possibly. But yeah. Again, it may so not be. DC series available for hire. Yeah. It <laughs> may not be necessary because we've got a mm -hmm. in the middle right, of the right. world, which, which is Yeah, they're, they're like an alternative version in their own right. Right. Yeah. Their, their own universe. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, I mean, um, these, these, these corporations, they do change character. They're not one, uh, they don't do this one way. There are times where they'll switch over. Yeah, I did focus the work on a time for the back when I switched to work. There are times where they would have traded their toys completely, or they would stand over you and tell you exactly how you were to play with their toys. Um, so it shifts. I mean, right now, DC is certainly not at the point, I don't think, where there'd be an alternative Batman Superman story where uh, they were in a stable gay relationship. <laughs> To be honest, I have never had problems with I found it it's easy to take corporate characters and turn them into mouthpieces for your own sad face. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of mouthpieces, there might be some in the audience. Um, would anybody out there who's suffering from a uh, post-mortem mushroom hallucination like to give up a question? Um, there are going to be microphones coming around, so if you stick your gentleman just here, Charlie, please wait for the mic. Um, 
said he was chilling late. Everyone knows. <laughs> 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 oh, it goes both ways. Yeah. Yeah. So no, I, don't, I always kind of, I guess I wouldn't have tried to be published if I didn't think it was good enough to be published. But again, you still have doubts. It's kind of changed how you, uh, how you die as a writer or any creative person. Wonders why the hell it's working. Any questions out here? Yeah, I So he, he was fantastic, all cult library, he was kind of, uh, and all that stuff. So I was always interested, but at 19 I was, I was kind of going nowhere, I'd just been rejected from art school, and I, you know, I was just flooding my parents, I had no girlfriend, it was really fucking horrible. <laughs> so I thought something has to work here, and I, I discovered magic, I discovered Crowley, and, and particularly chaos magic, which was happening at the time, and there's, there's a fanzine called the, the Lamp of Thor, which had been published from Greece, and these guys were introducing this whole the ideas of chaos, which were basically to update magic. And it felt like punk magic to me. It was the notion that you could build your own rituals and your own symbol sets and do things that were potent to you, rather than retreating to the symbols of the past, or you know, of, of ancient time frames or whatever. So I guess I got into it in that level. And only later did I realise that the comics were part of that. When I first when I was writing Zenith, there was a lot of magical references in it, but they were kind of you know, annotations. <coughs> but by the time I got to something like Flex Metallus, I was starting to think, how can you actually do magic using this medium? Because obviously a lot of magic in, in the past had been done via visual media, where you know, the hunters would paint Bison on the walls of their caves, and there's all spears going into them, all right, to close to Frank Pelvis at the moment. And this would provoke Bison to run into the path of the spirit. So I kind of figured, well, could I read comics and make things happen in my life and in the world? And I, that's that's the, the super short because I could go, I'll go on this all night and there's a lot of other stuff to talk about. But fast it's, forward to the tramp man. Yeah, fast forward to the tramp <laughs> man. So, yeah, so like as Warren says, when I, got, when I started doing the invisibles and it became, I thought, I'll really treat this as a magical work and I'll shave my head and I'll change places with the main character in the sense that I went to. If he was in Australia, I would go to Australia. If he was in a bungee jump, I would go to a bungee jump. If he was taking a particular drug, I would take the drug. If he was going out with a girl, I would find the girl. So I was kind of trying to exchange my life with this character. Then made the mistake of giving him a collapsed lung and he's tortured in a, a dentist chair by madmen. <laughs> and within, you know, he basically told me there was a, a virus eating his face. Within three months, I've got a virus eating my face. The scar is still there. I was in hospital with collapsed lungs two days from death. And basically I thought, okay, this is working. <laughs> <laughs> this, this voodoo comics idea is really working. I then gave the character a fantastic time and sexy girlfriend. And all of this suddenly poured into my own life. It's weird, various degrees. And, 
and, and uh, yeah, Tom and Errol are a bit ahead of us. I just remember the first I knew about this, I bumped into Frank quietly at a convention. I said, have you seen Frank? Is Frank coming? And Frank said, I don't know, he might be dead. <laughs> <laughs> But he said it in that tone of voice and said, that might not actually stop him from turning up. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so I mean, and it's still, I still do all stuff with my own, particularly with my magic watching. And the new stuff I'm doing with Music Moon with the Vintage is a super dark thing. I don't explore in a lot of the approach of Derek and Steffi and magic and the tunnels of Steff and all that kind of stuff. So it's, it's really dark occult. But yeah, I mean, I, I still, to me, it's, the work is the magic, it's always the kind of same thing, it's, it's how I do the practice. You know. Too late. <laughs> just going to break back to, to superheroes, just to sort of hold it yeah. <laughs> um, With the, the huge success of the superhero films and um, that, that kind of transition, it, superhero comics always succeeded because you could do, you could draw stuff that you could never afford to put on the screen at the time. Now technology's caught up and you can do all of that. Do you think that superheroes' life it, within that medium, within the comics medium, is shortened because of that? And is it going to transcend purely into cinema where it can do sound and movement and those sorts of things? It can do sound and movement, but it can't ever be more than two hours long. <laughs> it's small stories on a, on a bigger page, uh, and uh, I mean, ultimately people show up for the stories as well as the scale, uh, and uh, a movie can never be more than a palimpsest of the kind of story you could tell on paper. Yeah, and, and what comics do so well, and although television is now learning from comics, and comics do the extended narrative mm. so well, and they've been doing it for so long, they got really good at it, you know, you can follow Cyclops life for 40 years and it's been changed and you meet these people and it has an effect so I, I think that extended narrative you can spend so much time in a character's life is much more tricky than anything really The interesting good. thing actually uh, will be see how Marvel handle uh, the series they're doing at Netflix mm -hmm. which, is, which is much more that novelistic pace of, of like 13 hours mm -hmm. at a time some sources are doing four of them plus I think some or something. That will be interesting to watch to see if they actually go for novelistic television, uh, which is a very different beast to, to, to broadcast network or any television. If they go for the more novelistic house of cards, then that will be interesting. That might put us out of business. Out of business. I don't know. I don't care. I've got a busy career to today. <laughs> or unaccountability of individuals in the, uh, all challenges to secret identities have been successfully fought off and it seems to be that very much in the sense. Mm, interesting. No, I, I kind of think they can represent everything including that. So superheroes can be seen as, uh, as fascists or they can be seen as anarchists or they can be seen as just to name some things for them. But <laughs> they're, they're, they're basically capable of taking on anything. I did a, a story in Action Comics number nine so it's the idea of Superman being created as a, a pulper in the world. And the notion was that the, the sign can accommodate anything. The Nazi can get a hold of that S sign and need something to do with the world that was. So if you can't get a hold of it, if, if the anarchists got hold of it and wore it like Luther and Decker masks, it would mean something again. So I think what the characters are actually is that they're empty signs that can be filled with whatever the culture needs. Mm. So, so yes, to your, to your question, but also everything else too. They can represent everything else on, on any spectrum. So it actually just made me think of something else when you were talking about secret identities, because just what flew into my head, the one really interesting thing about 90s superhero comics was people had a good time beefing up. <laughs> uh, there was an interesting thing that they did completely accidentally, which is they actually removed the secret identity. The character was um, the character's name, the superhero name, the, the, the name you take on. None of them had secret identities. None of them had human lives. They were simply these, these living symbols and statements. 
Uh, but uh, it was nice to see the heroes from it, so they stood for absolutely nothing and meant nothing. <laughs> um, they were just these wandering words. Nineties Oh, God. It's been a nineties day. I did a podcast interview this morning and we ended up talking about that. The nineties, that immediate post rave indie dance. Yeah. Everything was orange. Nineties. <laughs> Yeah, I was, in, I was in this weird meeting room full with like Dave Lowe bean bag, and it was like being back in like a smart drug bar. And that was really great. Uh, I'd appreciate any any comments, but especially for Sarah, on the um, James Hewlett image that British Library is using to advertise this uh, wonderful exhibition in uh, the representation of gender. Oh. Basically, they're bringing that up. Um, I was analyzing this image, I've been analyzing it for the past two days, as well as the rest of the space around the character, and the, um, you can't see him in the shot, but the, the unconscious superhero figure in the alley behind her, and all of the things like the, the empty takeaway boxes and all, all the rubbish that's off to that side, and I do think that the image is both Expected and subversive at the same time. That I think that it is a very post um, hit girls and kick ass kind of image. Um, and of course, because of the artist and his work on gorillas, I keep seeing this as an alternate reality version of Noodle, and it's just bizarre. <laughs> but um, the idea of like, and it also reminds me of the pro, if that's, um, yeah, and, and that she was like world weary but she's also really, appears really young, and that she's got this really tiny outfit on, but at the same time, you get the impression that she's doing that so that you underestimate her, and then you end up like that guy in the alley behind her. But at the same time, part of me is like, I wish she had a little bit more on, because <laughs> the past, um, yeah. Do you, do you feel like it's like shrugged the image? I mean, basically it's like saying, well, the art sort of is what the art is. I mean, do you think that's that's adequate as a response to the the bit of the image comments? Or do you think we should be seriously? I wouldn't want to mischaracterise that as mm. adequate. As uh, so much as an explication, um, where we, we were bypassing genuinely important analysis. Sorry, I didn't mean to unwind you. But, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I did. <laughs> you put Jenny Clarkson trousers. <laughs> goes back to what Grant said about that the genre has expectations and limitations and playing around with those and getting something different out of it is what makes it fun and enjoyable. I mean, you can, in the case, you, can, you could say the art is what the art is, but that doesn't mean that the art all, always has to be that. Yeah. Or that, that well, also, I mean, and what criticism exists for is to talk about that. Mm -hmm. But that criticism is just allowed to guide or control what the artist chooses to draw. Mm -hmm. And maybe the artist just doesn't get it, or maybe he's a totally different perspective of what the drawing represents mm -hmm. than all of us. And I think we have to be aware of that. But criticism exists in order to say, have you thought that the drawing might represent this people? You know, and I think that's the importance of it. But never underestimate the fact that Jamie might have had something completely mm -hmm. different. Carol's wearing knuckles upstairs, she's shrinking, she hasn't got kick butt height of it. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so she's showing her belly buttons that really so awful, you know, like what's wrong with all our belly buttons that we can't look at them anymore? <laughs> Who did this to us? So <laughs> there's a lot of ways of examining yeah, and questioning I, images. I mean, examining is the word, because when we talk of, when, when we talk about that kind of gender representation mm -hmm. on Sensation and Comics, we're actually talking about work that is has gone unexamined. Yeah. Mm -hmm. notes describe her as a cross between Britney Spears and Supergirl is wearing the tiny outfits. There's a bit where she 
will will be hasn't been drawn yet uh, to my knowledge practicing the Escher girl breathing but 90 poses in front of the mirror mm -hmm. that um, then from from her standpoint that that's what she believes the public wants and that's what she mm -hmm. wants to give them whereas a character like um, the protagonist or Spetsnet who had a background in theater and she goes around this big like Judge Dredd esque shoulder pad armor kind of thing with a cape that's um, not what her image is about and right. so it's like if this character this is not necessarily what I mean by unexamined yeah. this unexamined by the creators mm -hmm. because when you do that you're coming to it with a weight of blissful yeah. cultural awareness and you've got something which, to say which might be going on with her like that, that might well, be well it might yeah. be going on with her but a lot of the stuff we were talking about should be the nosy stuff it wasn't mm -hmm. necessarily yeah. being examined by the creators so, yeah. so we're not bringing so we're not necessarily even bringing the political consciousness or awareness mm -hmm. to the work this is simply the way things were and what you brought and Tubby Simon couldn't draw a suit <laughs> there are a few artists. There, there, there was one artist who, if you had to draw feet, they were either in boots or if you had to draw them barefoot, it would suddenly make sure that they were standing on a big luxurious club. Up to the foot, up to the ankle. Yeah, if you like one of the gold ones, they did that. Yeah, yeah. Dylan did that on his side, yeah. And Eddie Bramble was so paranoid about it, whether it needed or not, he put a pair of feet in every page he drew. Yes! In six poles. Yeah, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think we've got a couple more questions, then this one just there, and then there's Jeff in the middle there. Oh, the, um, the artist Matthew Stone has a wonderful phrase, the... Uh, Optimism as cultural rebellion. I'd love to hear you talk a little bit about that idea and why superheroes are, are appropriate for it. Well, I, I mean, I've talked about this before because I talked about it so much and because I got heckled about it so much. <laughs> I've been really reading up on nihilism recently. <laughs> <laughs> and I've been totally getting into all this anti natal and I've been like, let's just have humanity commit suicide tomorrow. <laughs> so <laughs> that's what my new comic books are about because I've actually decided that I want to embrace the whole zombie ethos that's uh, completely overridden our culture. And it's, I mean, I'm getting bored. Sorry to just send me a friend, like. <laughs> 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 so the next stuff is just all about saying there's absolutely no fucking difference. <laughs> 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 nice warm, healthy drink from India. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think, I think the, as you know from me, I mean, that's, I think the only virtue that they have is their, 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 their absolute unreality and the fact that they like to say things that aren't true but can at least guide us towards them and point fingers towards what if super humanity meant not just super strength or invulnerability but also super compassion, mm -hmm. super creativity, super connectivity. And that's, I think they are only worthwhile to talk about those things. So for me, it's always been the superhero dress is going to be somewhere in the point where people are allowed to talk about optimistic things and, and a potential future for humanity rather than the, the one you feel you can be so grateful about. But the artwork's not real. I mean, they're only real as ideas. They're only real as, as paper things and, and how they're meant to see. Are we not thinking at that time that the Superman radio serial took on the KKK yeah. in 1948? Yeah. 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 And it shut them right down, didn't it? <laughs> <laughs> well, it did bring the recruitment down quite a no, bit. No, certainly, yeah. actually, it did. But I mean, even as I say, I think no matter how hard Superman tries, they can only do so yeah. much. But at least they can do that much. Mm -hmm. I think that's what. That, that's why I think these things only function well as, as aspirational and as uh, shining figures on the horizon to guide us towards. You must have a different. Sorry, I'm not a trumpet. <laughs> 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 Speak, boy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is to any of you there. Um, obviously, the last sort of 20, 30 years, um, some of the British creators have produced some of the best modern comics, including yourselves, of course. What is it particularly about British creators um, that they've created such kind of radical versions of the comics, such original ideas. Obviously, there's the whole idea of the outsider looking in, 
But what else is it about the British creator that produces brilliant cultural punishment? <laughs> <laughs> I, I have two stock answers to this. Um, the first is that w British culture writers were raised in a very different comic environment. Mm. Uh, mm. Anthology comics that had a very high turnover of new material. So if you grew up reading British comics, you grew up thinking the job of the British comic writer or of any comic writer was to have new ideas and generate new things and come up with new takes that takes on things. Um, because I, I, I don't think it's necessarily unfair to say we're a lot more prolific with generation of new material um, than the Americans. Because the Americans grow up or grew up with, with monthly corporate superhero comics. So they grow up thinking the job of a comic writer is that you go and write Spider Man or you go and write Superman. It's n it wasn't necessarily an environment that suggested. <coughs> there was space for you to bring new material and your own ideas to market. The other answer I'd give is uh, all the British comic writers had girlfriends and the American ones didn't. <laughs> <laughs> Which, yes, I think covers it, Sam. Yeah. We have we better culture, we better TV, we grew up on <laughs> Flavor Today and Ben mm -hmm. Porter, yeah. and all that stuff was influencing us, not just the comics. We had newspapers with news in. And the top of the pops and Jimmy Savile and all that. Top of the culture, we had it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> top of the pops is actually a really interesting example of the years because I remember having to explain this to my daughter. Uh, Top of the Box was a weekly television show on which, in the same half hour, you could see, um, oh God, what was it? It was, it, it, it'd be like a punch, it'd be the clash, uh, and there was status quo, and it's on top back. And then, and then Laurie Anderson, and then, I don't know, half man, half biscuit. It was b because, because we had common culture back then where everyone watched the same things. The music programs had to reflect everything the audience was listening to. Mm -hmm. So packed into that half hour would be six or seven utterly different musical genres. Yeah. And you'd get, you'd get exposed to all of them. Yeah. And the, the whole the, the tradition, I think, as well, of, of English surrealism, as I've always called it, through Lewis Carroll and the Beatles and Yellow Submarine, the Avengers, the Prisoner, that was so much of what was feeding into what we do as well. I think it's visible in the flavour of it. Yeah, and our, and our genuine eccentrics could would be given money to make television shows mm -hmm. rather than they put on a stage and pointed back in television shows as happens now. Uh, you know, people who wouldn't get arrested for their Dennis Potter yeah. uh, twice for making masks and I all the same right if you want television. I think there's something to be said for the fact that growing up, well, we grew up at slightly different points, but you know, if you grew up in the 1970s <coughs> and 80s in Britain, um, the US, in my memory of it, seemed like an alternate world. It was mm. kind of similar but different. You know, actually, it was literally about six months in the future because films would come out beforehand. So if you went to see Boston or something in the summer, you could see a film which wasn't going to be released in Britain until, yeah, until yeah. December. And they yeah. had different kinds of Coca Cola, different kinds. You had clear tab or something, a cherry coat. At you least watch the TV coming out of London. If there was an ad for a film in London, and yeah. then you'd get to see our film in the next three weeks. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. American television was very, was 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 very strange for me when I first saw it in the 1980s. Mm. Much much faster, much more channels, totally different adverts, totally different types different of cartoons. structure. So to, to to me, I wonder if that kind of generation. I know we're talking about a generation quite different, but a generation who came from 2000 and being Mrs. Peter to the Vertigo in late 1980s grew up with the idea of America as a kind of imaginary in the way that Americans didn't, and that really would help in imagining, well, it's also universes, which is what you're doing with digital mm. comics. You're imagining a kind of stylized, bigger, more futuristic version of the United States. And so, if someone like Peter Milligan doing The Shade of Changing Man, um, the American screen traveling across the United States is coming from a much stranger perspective. He's seeing the United States in, in a much more distant, alienated and surreal way, mm. and that was really helpful. I mean, al also, I mean, just to get beyond one piece, a, a, a structural thing that's occurred to me where American television was always 22, 24 episodes. Mm. British television was six episodes, and then there'd be something new. Mm. And I think that probably speaks to it to some extent as well. In 2000 AD, it was kind of like the top of box comics, wasn't it? It was, oh, yeah, it was yeah. six or seven or eight. I think that's what they do, I think, yeah.
Pink started writing yeah. in that with him. Right. Right. So how did he do it? It's just television, it's okay then. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> can you write it on ecstasy at some point? I wrote uh, really, really and truly, yeah. On, on one day, 14 shows yeah. before I had it. On one day. <laughs> on a, a drug called a schnozel. <laughs> 800 years ago.